Welcome again. Uh, good morning, uh, Christ Baptist Church family and those who are joining us for our devotions in Daniel. Yesterday we did Daniel chapter 1 and uh, this morning we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 2. Quite a long chapter of, uh, of, of what's happening in Daniel. And this chapter in particular is the first chapter that looks specifically at biblical prophecy of what's happening from the time of Daniel all the way to the time of the end. We're going to take a look at that here. And uh, uh, we're going to start right here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. We're not going to read every verse because, you know, if I look here, I can see that there's 49 verses, so I don't think we need to read and explain 49 verses here. But remember what happened in Daniel chapter 1. 605 B.C., Daniel was taken captive along with some of his friends. They were members of the royal household and they were taken captive from Jerusalem and whisked away to Babylon where they're in a completely different culture. And Daniel at that time said, even if I'm going to be in a different place, I'm locked down, I can't even speak Hebrew, I'm going to commit myself. I'm going to basically resolve myself to not defile myself in any way from the law of God and specifically we saw in chapter 1 a key verse there was Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food for the wine he drank so he was faced right away with having to deal with violating his conscience on obeying the law of Moses or obeying the king and, and we saw that he he used his wisdom, and the wisdom that God gave him, of being able to negotiate a way to show them that God's law was actually better for him and better for the king. And so we saw that happen. Now here in chapter 2, we now begin really at the end of his three-year training, at the end of this. And it says in chapter 2, verse 1, Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. And while it says it's the second year, there was a, there's a difference in recording this from the, the Hebrew version versus the Babylonian version of which year it is. And basically, by, by putting those together, we can see that this is actually at the very end of Daniel's three-year training. So Daniel's now in the king's service. He's ready to go, and he's uh, an employee of the king. And I'll just show you where the breaks are in this, but verses 1 to 13 really show us the predicament that the king was in. The, 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 the background, the, the setting of chapter 2 is that the king had a dream. He had a dream very specifically, and we saw that in verse 1. He had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. So he had a dream, and he was awake all night. And so verse 2 says, the king gives orders to call in all the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, all the people who practice the funny business that they had there in Babylon, that claimed that they had authority, and he called them in. And basically, he told them this, which is interesting. It shows, it shows you that the king really understood what was really magic and spiritual and what wasn't. He could understand that. And the reason he understood it was because of how he addressed the guys in, in chapter three, 2, verse 4. He says, the, 3 and 4, he, he said, look, I had a dream and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. And so, of course, here come the magicians. They're all excited. Oh, great, O oh, king, just tell us a dream and we will tell you the most magnificent interpretation. Well, verse 5, the king says, look, I've been around you guys enough. I understand. I grew up in the, in, the, in, the, in the government. I grew up in this. I understand how you guys operate. The king said to the Chaldeans, the command for me is firm. Which, actually, when you, when you look at what this was written in, in Aramaic, it, it, it says, actually, the, the word for me is more sure. The word for me is, is, is gone for me. I, Look, I can't remember much. He said, Luke, you tell me the dream. And then tell me the interpretation. 
He says, see, I understand. I'll give you a dream. You're going to give me some nonsensical interpretation. I understand that. We're not going to go down that road. He said, you tell me the dream first, and then tell me the interpretation. Then I'll be impressed. So he said that. And it was so much, and he was so concerned about it, so concerned. He said, if you don't do it, you're going to be torn limb from limb, and your house will be made of rubbish sheep. I will tear you limb from limb, and I'll destroy your family if you cannot do this one thing. That doesn't tell us how weak they are. That tells us how fearful the king was, how fearful he was. Now, here's a question. Why would he be so fearful? Why would he really want to have this interpretation just, just given to him so importantly? Well, let me give you a little history. Babylon had extended out, and they're pretty far away, pretty far away out in the, in the region of today's modern-day Iraq, and he's all the way to Israel now, and, and, and went, went there and, and extracted Daniel and brought him back to Babylon. So his army is spread out all over there, and he's had a number of battles that have taken place, and he He's wondering if he can keep his kingdom, if he can hold on to it. You see, that's his concern. Any king that is extended out, like the Roman Empire, they're nervous. They're, 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 they're like cats, kind of nervous, always wondering if somebody's going to step on their tail because they can't keep what they're holding. And that's what was going on with Nebuchadnezzar. That was what his dream was. That's what he was concerned about, and that's why... He just couldn't sleep, and so he's just really anxious about his power. So he pulls his magicians in and says, we're not fooling around, guys. you got to tell me the dream and its interpretation. I'm not going to put up with any nonsense. And so they answer a second time, and they say, look, we can't tell you the interpretation until we know the dream. And he said, don't stall. Verse 8, he says, I can see you're bargaining for time. That's not going to work. Now I'm just getting even more angry at you. If you don't make the dream known to me, there's only one decree for you. Look at, look at how his anger goes in verse 9. For you've agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation has changed. You're going to keep stalling for time, hoping I'll change my mind. So therefore, tell me the dream, otherwise, so then, then, then you can tell me the interpretation. Well, the magicians understood there's no way they could get out of this. So they admit to the king in verse 10. They say, there's not a man on earth who could do what you ask. Not a man on earth who could do what you ask. And as much as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this. I mean, you're the first guy that's ever asked this. And not only that, verse 11, the thing which the king demands is difficult. No one who can do this, no one is is able to do this except for the gods. So they acknowledge only God can provide you this situation. So the king can't remember and he wants to know the interpretation. It's really on his mind and he's really fearful. All his special helpers, magicians, scientists come in and they say what you ask is impossible. And so Verses 12 and 13, the king just says, okay, fine, then I'm going to kill every last one of you. He became furious, and he gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree goes forth. Daniel was one of those wise men. The king didn't care. He didn't know Daniel. He just knew that he was a really good guy. But he didn't care. He was that upset at his dream that he would wipe out a lot of his assets. So that's the situation that all of a sudden we find ourselves in. Like we said, it's interesting how God can just cause great chaos, just like we're in here now. All the borders are shut around the world. No one can travel. Governments have locked everybody down in their houses. No one can move. Doctors and hospitals are terrified that we're just at the tip of the storm all because of one small virus that we've known about for decades. We've known about this kind of virus for a long time. Look how God can just turn things around. A dream, a simple dream, 
And one king is so furious, he's going to wipe out all of his, his advisors. Well, verses 14 to 18 then, tell us how this impacted Daniel. And notice verse 14, Daniel replied with discretion and discernment. Notice that. How did he have discretion and discernment? Well, because he's at peace with following the law of his God. You know, he's living and, and acting and speaking the way he knows he ought to. He's at peace with his God. And nothing is bothering him. So he hears this. He hears this order coming out. Because they were looking for Daniel and his friends to kill them, verse 13 says. And so he replies with discretion and discernment to the captain of the king's bodyguard, who is going out to kill everybody. So he doesn't react in panic. He doesn't, he doesn't just worry about his own life. And his question is, is not, why is the king doing this? His question is, why is it so urgent? You see, he's not, he's not questioning the king's judgment. He's just saying, why does this have to be executed in such a, a, a quick fashion? So, Ariok tells Daniel about the dream and everything that's going on. So Daniel goes in and requested of the king to give him time. Just give me one night. I mean, come on, king. Uh, one night, one night, and I am telling you I, that this can happen. One night that he might declare the interpretation of the king. He didn't tell him about his God because Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't understand about his God. All Daniel said, he just looked him in the eye and said, one night, and I'll give you the interpretation. So, he was given that night, Daniel went to his house, informed his three friends, which we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he informed them about this, and he said, look, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to all pray to God about this, because otherwise we're going to die. We've got nothing to lose. You see, when you've got nothing to lose, that's when prayer is most real. It's most comforting. It's when you go right to your God, because then you know exactly what you're praying for. When you feel like there's no other place to go. And it's unfortunate that we go to that level, because with our sin nature, we, we don't see God so clearly with all of our work and our prosperity that we're doing. Well, Daniel didn't have any of that to confuse him. And so he prayed and requested that God would have compassion concerning this mystery. God would reveal that so they wouldn't be destroyed because their alternative is they're going to die. So that's Daniel's situation. Now, verses 19 to 30 show us that the secret is revealed. God revealed it. So... Verse 19 says it very clearly. Interesting how the writer doesn't tell us all what's going on here. He just says, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. There you go. Daniel got it. And as soon as he got it, Daniel gave praise to God. You see, he was ready to give praise to God because he'd been praying to God. When the prayer was answered, immediately praise came. That's how we should be. When we are praying, we should be looking for the answer. And when we see the answer, we should praise right away, instantly. And Daniel talked in his, his praise here about praising God, let his name be blessed forever and ever. All wisdom and power belong to him. He who changes the times and the epochs, removes kings and establishes kings. Interesting that Daniel prayed this. Let's just look at this just briefly again. That... It's he who changes the times and epochs, he removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. He, verse 21 is really what the dream is about. Changing kings and kingdoms. And giving wisdom is what he gave Daniel, knowledge. And he revealed, verse 22, profound and hidden things, things in the darkness. So he's praising him for exactly what he did. So I give thanks and praise, verse 23, for you've given me wisdom and power, and now you've made known to me what we requested of you. Get that? He's praising exactly what he prayed for. You have made known to me what we requested of you, for you've made known to us the king's matter. That's it. Daniel says, I now know the dream. 
So verses 24 to 30, Daniel now is working to make an appointment. In verse 24, he says, Daniel goes into Arioch, and, and interesting, it says, Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, that Arioch, he went in to the, to, the, to the executioner and he spoke to him. He says, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king's presence and I'll declare the interpretation of the king. He says, I've got the solution. But I want you to see very clearly here Daniel's heart. He didn't come in and says, I've got this, so don't kill Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's not what he said. What he said was, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. He cared about all of the wise men of Babylon, all the people who taunted him, all the people who treated him badly, all the people who were his enemies. He said, do not destroy them. They have no reason to be destroyed. You see, Daniel's heart was for their lives. He cared about all people because he cared about God. So he went in with that request. So verse 25, Arioch brings Daniel to the king and says, I found a man among the exiles from Judah who can, who can give you your answer. He can make your interpretation, which means he can explain your dream. So, again, verse 26 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar didn't really know Daniel very well at all. He said, are you, the, are you able to do this? It's just very bluntly. Are you, I want to look at you because, see, the previous magicians all said, Oh, king, no one can do this. Oh, king, tell us the dream and we'll tell you the interpretation. They had all kinds of excuses or workarounds to try to say, I can make this happen if you do this. King just looked at him and says, Are you able to give me the interpretation? That's it. Daniel answered the king. Verse 27. Daniel reminds the king, oh, by the way, as for the mystery, what you want to know, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, nor diviners are able to declare it to the king. Everybody's failed, haven't they, king? I'm just reminding you. What a difference in confidence after spending time in prayer with the Lord, getting an answered prayer from the Lord. You can come before the king where everybody else was just melting like butter, and you stand there and you look at the king and say, let me remind you, everybody else has failed. Is that right, king? Talk about the boldness that he's got. And then verse 28, he doesn't say, I can do it. That's not what he says. Now's the time when I am bold to say everybody else has failed. He says, however, there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he's made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in the latter days. This was your dream and the visions in your mind while on your bed. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future, and he who reveals mysteries has made known to you what will take place. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the interpretation known to the king that you might understand the thoughts of your mind. He is saying, you're right, everybody else has failed. But I want you to know before I talk to you, that there's a God in heaven who knows all of this and he wants you to know the answer to the mysteries and the thoughts that you have in your mind. So Daniel just says, I'm taking my time to be bold and I'm not, I'm using my opportunity of giving you the interpretation, but I'm telling you first, I'm introducing you to God, my God, there he is, and he's going to give to you, he's gracious. So verses 31 to 35 then tell us what the dream is. And the dream is pretty straightforward. He says, you king were looking and you saw a great statue, big giant statue of extraordinary splendor in front of you. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, breast its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze. Its legs were of iron, its feet were partly of iron and partly of clay. Now, you kept looking at this statue. You kept looking at the statue until there was a stone cut out without hands, came out of a mountain without hands, and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all crushed at the same time and became chipped like the summer threshing floors. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That was your dream. Can you imagine the look in the king's eyes when he remembers now his whole dream? 
and it was replayed to him front to back as he's talking about you were looking at this statue there's a head of gold there's a chest of silver there's there's a, a, a belly of bronze or a belly of thighs of bronze legs of iron feet partly of iron partly of clay and then the stone comes and just crushes everything yep that's the dream at that point in time after hearing that you, you can imagine Nebuchadnezzar's temperament the boldness of Daniel to say, oh right, your magicians couldn't do anything, could they, king? Now the king's starting to get a little irritated. He says, I know there's a God in heaven who's going to give you what you want. Nebuchadnezzar saying, okay, Daniel, you got one chance, buddy. But I'm going to give it to you. But if it doesn't fly, you're going to be like the rest of them and kill them all. I'm that concerned. Daniel never blinked. He never flinched. And then he tells this dream front to back. Now the king, who could have been standing at the time, looking at Daniel, overpowering, sits down, and he sits back. And it's like, I'm now ready to listen. In other words, I, Nebuchadnezzar, am the student. You, Daniel, are the teacher. And he's ready to hear the interpretation. And that's verses 36 to 45. And here's the interpretation. This was the dream. Now we'll tell its interpretation before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Why is he doing all this? Is he just playing for the king? Daniel's been so bold. Why is he now giving him these accolades? Why is he giving him such praise? Well, it's because of his dream. His dream was concerning him because he was afraid he's losing power and all of that. And so Daniel says, look, you are the king that is in absolute control right now. Absolutely. Let me calm you down. You are that king. You can relax. This is, this is what God's plan is for you. You are the head of gold, he says in verse 38. You are that head of gold. But after you, verse 39, there will rise another kingdom inferior to you, and then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. So we can see that gold, silver, bronze, the kingdoms are not quite as strong as they were they're going, but it's after you, king, after you. So you're not, your, your kingdom's not threatened. And then another king's going to come, and another kingdom's going to come. And in verse 40, there's a fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, and it's going to come. What do we see from this that he's telling Nebuchadnezzar? King, you've got control now. You'll have it in your lifetime, but you will not be able to hold on to it. God brings kingdoms. He, he makes kingdoms rise. He causes them to fall. There's no kingdom on the earth that will last forever or that will last in, in, a, in a time that a, a person thinks that he's got absolute control. Absolutely not. That's the way it works. God raises kings. He brings them down just like he's doing right now around the world. And so kingdoms are going to come in the order that God has. And the last is this fourth kingdom, as strong as iron, and as much as iron crushes and shatters all things, so that iron breaks it in pieces, it'll crush and break all these things in pieces. Basically, what we know looking back now in history, that Babylon is the head of gold, and the Medes and the Persians who defeated Babylon in Daniel chapter 5. That's the next kingdom. That's the chest of silver. And we know that the Greeks and Alexander the Great came and defeated all of the Persian Empire. And the Greeks are the, uh, the thighs of bronze. And now we have the, the Roman Empire, which is the legs and the feet of iron and iron of clay because the Roman Empire became very strong after three Punic Wars and came in and solidified all of their, their, their military might, took over all of Italy and began to rule all over Europe. But as they extended out, they had to incorporate with all the peoples and so they became mixed, like iron mixes with clay because they couldn't hold on to it. They kept expanding to where they were so diluted. And that's what this fourth kingdom is. 
Verse 41, and that you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it'll be a divided kingdom. The Roman Empire was very divided. And it will have in it the toughness of iron, Roman army mixed in everywhere, and as much as you saw the iron mixed with common clay, as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of pottery, so some of the kingdom will be strong and part of it will be brittle. That's what we saw. The Eastern and Western Roman Empire, it's going back and forth. And in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they'll combine with one another in the seed of men, but they'll not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. This is interesting. They'll combine with marriage, intermarriage, with the seed of men. They're going to try to come in together, but you know what? That mixes the iron and the clay. It mixes loyalties. When you try to combine tribes to create one unified situation, you're not going to get there because it's all divided. The people are divided. And so the empire, as we know now, Rome is not a very strong empire. It was, but then it lasted about six, seven hundred years and then it went down. But in those days, verse 44 tells us now, Daniel is giving the interpretation. Of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. And so he says, Inasmuch as you saw a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it crushed everything, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. The reason it's true and trustworthy is because I was able to tell it to you and you couldn't even remember it. Therefore, it is real. And I could do what nobody else could do because God has given this to you. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar, you can't hold on to what you've got. God's plan's going to go. But you know what? Nobody's going to be able to get what they want because in the end, his kingdom will crush every kingdom. And that God is still with us even right now. He doesn't come later in the end. He's here now. That's the message that Daniel gave to the king. It's a message of prophecy of the future. And what's very interesting here <clears throat> is that Daniel as a Jew would expect all prophecies to relate to Israel. None of these prophecies are saying it's specific to Israel. It's specific to Nebuchadnezzar and goes out from him all the kings that are going to take place. Certainly Israel is affected and his kingdom will come, but this is saying end times, eschatology, is for all people. And he gave it to the king. And you know he also gave it to Daniel. Daniel, his trusted servant, heard this as well and understood even though he, God's people, is locked away in Babylon, God has not forgotten his people because he gave this to Daniel. <clears throat> End times, eschatology, is the great hope that we have that causes us to be able to endure the situation we're in, to know what the end is going to be. And that's what he gave to Daniel and he gave to the king. The king was so impacted by this. He actually fell on his face and he did homage to Daniel, meaning he prostrated himself before Daniel, ordered that he be given an offering and promoted him. And he said, Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. In other words, Daniel, because of what you told me at the beginning, I now understand it's your God who did this, not you. You see, Daniel made very clear from the very beginning in his boldness that his God was the one that was at work. And so he gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. He was chief over all the magicians because he saved their lives. And then Daniel made one request of the king and said, My three friends who are equally gifted with wisdom, can you put them over the kingdom as well? And they were. Well, Daniel was at the king's court. So what we see here is Daniel was given really an understanding of God's plan to be given at the king at a time when the king was so stressed out he was going to kill all of his advisors. 
And you know what's interesting about this? It all starts with Daniel making up his mind to follow God's law and God's ways, which means he was very sensitive to God's leading, very sensitive to God's word, so that when God's word came to him, and an understanding of God's word came to his mind, he was able to present it to the king with boldness, but also with honor and respect and credibility so that the king believed it and it changed history right there in the moment. You see, Daniel was prepared when revelation came to him, when an understanding of God's word came to him, he was able to speak it with humility and conviction. And that's what drove the king to accept this new reality. And it was a reality that would not affect the king right away, but it would affect his future kingdoms. And it gave an eschatology, it meaning an end times understanding, to not only Daniel, but to the king, the, gent the, the Gentile, the pagan, for him. Because God is a God of all people, even though he does have his special people, Israel. So that's what we learned here. A few observations of this long chapter of the beginning of the prophecies of the future kingdoms that God's going to have set up. And we're now in that time of the Roman kingdom. And, and you might be asking, what about the Roman kingdom? Well, it's gone now, and, and now what time are we in? I said, oh, no, we're still in the Roman kingdom time. If you looked at a dollar bill, a United States dollar bill, you would look, and in Latin is written on that dollar bill, E Pluribus Unum, out of the many, one. You see, the United States government, as well as many governments now around the world, are based on the Roman system of government. So that government's still out, but it's all partly iron, partly clay, and everything's kind of broken. We're in that time, eventually to be crushed by the stone cut out from a mountain without hands. God's kingdom that will crush all kingdoms like chaff. And that's Daniel chapter 2. So I thank you for being with us. And I hope you can join us next uh, devotion also as we take tackle Daniel chapter 3 of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Thank you. 30 minutes there.